Let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to read from verse 15 down to the end. Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 to the end. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And we're reading, of course, from the authorized version. Now, I always stress that, and I stress that for this reason. It's been brought to my attention again that the authorized version of the Holy Scriptures is one of those banned books by Roman Catholicism regard its own adherence. So they tell them you can read other books, you can read other versions of the Bible, but don't read the authorized version. And of course, I wonder why. Uh, of course, this uh, version has the, the very stamp of God upon it uh, as far as revival blessing is concerned in our land. And I was really encouraged last night on the road to uh, Macrafelt. Uh, Brother Sidney Swandle and myself were, were listening to a little message from the late Dr. Paisley. And he said one of the comments that he made was, he only had a book when he got into the pulpit. He only had a book, God's book. And of course, he mentioned uh, that about the authorized version. So um, I, I stress that to you. Philippians chapter 3, verse 15. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Amen. We know the Lord will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now, now my text this morning is taken from Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. It reads as follows, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now my theme today is possessing heavenly mindedness. Being heavenly minded is a must, I believe, for every true born again believer. Every Christian has a duty to have heaven on their mind continually. Now remember the context of these words. The apostle Paul is in prison at Rome. He's chained to two guards 24-7. He's under sentence of death. That sentence could be carried out at any moment. His earthly life would be over. What was his crime for his imprisonment? None other than the fact that he was a preacher of the gospel. And yet despite these circumstances and this situation that he is in, he doesn't sit there in the cell and have a pity party. He doesn't think 
poor me. He's not thinking of himself at all. He's thinking primarily of the church at Philippi, a church under God which he helped to find. Now, he is well aware, it's been brought to his attention, that the Christians in that church were in danger of losing their joy. The overall theme of the book of Philippians is be joyful or rejoice in the Lord. And I've told you before, uh, look up the word joy and rejoice and rejoicing and count the many times that it's used. I think in totality, there's about 19 references. So the overall theme of this book is to be joyful. And Paul is well aware that the Christians at Philippi are in danger of losing their joy. He knows that the believers were in danger of losing sight of the gospel. Losing sight of the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ as the only saviour of sinners. You see, this church was under attack from false teachers who had come to Philippi, sowing seeds of doubt and confusion, seeking to plant them in the minds of the true believers. This was a serious situation that was developing back in those days. And Paul's aware that the church is facing the danger or the error of legalism. Certain Judaizers had come in saying, yes, you need Christ. He is great to have, but he's not enough. You need Christ plus something more, something else. You need the law of Moses. You need the right of circumcision. And and, and Paul denounces that. Paul knows they're facing the error of perfectionism. There's those that have come to Philippi saying that the Christian can reach a plane and a place in Christ that he could never sin. A kind of spiritual utopia in one's life. And Paul knows it's a lie. He knows that it's from the devil. He knows that they're facing another error, the error of antinomianism. Anti being against um, nomianism from the uh, noun uh, nomos, which means law against the law. They were saying, now you're saved. You're no longer under the condemnation of the law. Aye, and better than that, you're no longer under the code of the law. You don't need the law to live by. All you need is the law of love. So here's the Apostle Paul, and he writes to this church out of godly pastoral concern, out of love for them. Did you notice the word brethren in the reading? He mentions it at least twice here. Brethren. It's a term of endearment. It's a term that shows that he had a passionate love for these individuals. And and out of love, he feels for them and the situation that they face. And there he is in prison. He's not thinking of himself. He's thinking of these believers, the danger of losing their joy of the Lord, their danger of losing sight of the gospel, losing sight of the all-sufficiency of Christ. And he wants them to focus on the true gospel. He knows that nothing can lift the heart of a true believer like a a fresh vision of Jesus Christ. What will strengthen your joy? What will strengthen your weak faith? What will help counter the attacks of the devil is a a fresh vision of Christ to, to focus on the true gospel. He's already told these believers at Philippi, don't follow the example of the false professors. He reminds them that there's a distinction between the false professors and what's in their mind and what ought to be in the mind of the true Christian. The false professor, the false teachers living for earthly things, their mind is on the things of the world, but the true Christian is different. And in light of the union that he has in Jesus Christ, one of the things that should be uppermost in his mind is heaven should be on his mind. He he should be living out the gospel. He should be looking for Christ. He should be looking forward to the day when even the body is going to be saved and made perfect like Christ's glorious body. And it's all because of the gospel. And here's the real reason for them to rejoice in the Lord. And it was Lloyd-Jones that said, Martin Lloyd-Jones in Philippians 3, 20, 21, in his commentary, that 
This text is the glorious climax of the power of the gospel in the life of the believer. The true believer must strive to be heavenly minded. And maybe you're here today and and your heart and mind is full of heaviness. Maybe you're facing a, a difficult situation in your life. Maybe you're here in a state of deep discouragement and you're feeling spiritually defeated. And maybe you're filled with unbelief and you're, you're full of worry and fear and you're, you're, you're fearful for your family. You're, you're fearful for the state of the church and I'm, I'm thinking of the free church primarily. You, you're fearful about the state of the country. Is that true of you this morning? Could I ask, have you left the Lord out of the picture? Because you've left the Lord out of the picture, is it robbing you of your joy in Christ? Are you fearful about the future of the church, the, 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 the fall in attendance, the, the threat of churches having to close? Those that talk like that and think like that are, are really, I believe, leaving the Lord out of the picture. And it's robbing them of their joy and peace in Christ. Well, if that's the case this morning, I have a message for you. And the message is this. You need to fill your heart and mind full of the gospel of Christ. In all the outworking of his person and work. Think of who God is and what he's like. And think of this fact that you need this morning to possess what I'm calling heavenly mindedness. So, With that short introduction, let's think of three things in the text. This is what the Christian has to fill his mind with. This is what he has to think on. Look at the text. For our conversation is in heaven. I want you to think of the home of the Christian. Think of the glorious home of the Christian. For our conversation is in heaven. Think of the word heaven. Now now think of the reality of heaven. Heaven's a real place. It was the Lord Jesus that uh, spoke often of, of heaven to comfort and encourage his disciples whose hearts and minds were full of sadness and doubt and fear. Remember he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are what? Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Heaven is not only the abode of God, but heaven is also the home of every Christian. This world is not our home. We're we're just passing through. This morning, the ungodly have no real interest in heaven. They don't believe that there is such a place. They they reject that truth. Their hearts and minds are 100% preoccupied with the things of the world. We could say of the ungodly, the unsaved, the unregenerate this morning, heaven is not in their mind. They may hope one day to enter heaven. If if there is such a place, they'll probably tell themselves. But, but at this moment in time, they want nothing or little to do with God or Jesus Christ or the Christian life. Heaven is not in their mind. And remember, Jesus said, marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. If, if our birth on earth is registered, then think about the registering of our birth in heaven. The, the birth being placed in God's book, the Lamb's book of life. And and the new birth is born from above, born of the Holy Spirit, born because of the work of the Spirit in the heart and life. And I want to ask this morning, have you this thought, this assurance that heaven is your eternal home? Have you the assurance of going there one day? Do you think often of heaven? Have you a testimony that you're going to enter heaven because you've been born again of the Holy Spirit? That that you've been born into the kingdom of heaven. And it's not unnatural for you to think of heaven. You, You have an interest in that place. I want you to think not only of the reality of heaven, but I think I want you to think of remembering heaven. 
If you look at our text, it says in Philippians chapter 3, notice the word conversation. For our conversation is in heaven. Now remember Paul's drawing a contrast between the false professor, whom he has already told us, whose mind earthly things. And then he says, for our conversation. The word for could be translated because. Our, he's thinking of himself as well as the believers, the saints at Philippi. For our conversation is in heaven. Now, now what does that word conversation mean? Well, well, it has to do with speech. We, we recognize that. But it's more than about language. The word conversation in the old Elizabethan language meant much more than speech. It has to do with lifestyle. It has to do with our manner of living. It has to do with our life behavior here and now. Now now think of it. Because our lifestyle, because our manner of living, because our behavior is in heaven. The, the commentators suggest that the word literally should mean citizenship. For our citizenship is in heaven. You see, the believers were living in Philippi, and they were familiar with citizenship because Philippi was a colony of Rome. And you, if you were able to transport yourself back in time to Philippi, you would see Roman custom there. You would see Roman style of clothing there, Roman architecture, Roman fashion. Because many were living as if there were Romans in Philippi, as if they were in Rome itself. Life in Philippi corresponded to the way life was lived in Rome. And Paul realized that's a spiritual truth. You're living in Philippi as earthly citizens. But remember... We are really citizens of heaven. What is a true Christian? Someone who's born again of the Holy Spirit. Someone who's repented of their sin and received Christ by faith as Lord and Savior. Yes, that's true. The true Christian, of course, lives and works out his life on earth. He looks after his family. He provides for their needs. And here he is living out his earthly life. Going about his day-to-day business. Eating and sleeping and drinking and working and all the rest. And yet all the while he's on earth living out his physical life. That individual who's in Christ. Who's received Christ by faith as Lord and Savior. He's really a stranger. He's really a pilgrim. His testimony is this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Why? Because he's realized and remembers that he's a citizen of heaven. He he, he lives on earth as a resident alien. Why? Because he's a citizen of heaven. A citizen of heaven by the new birth. He's been born into the kingdom of heaven. He's a citizen of heaven by virtue of union with Jesus Christ. He's a citizen of heaven because the grace of God has been revealed to him in Christ. And I want to tell you something else. That's true right now. Look at the text. For our conversation is. Underline the little word is. You see, it's not merely a future day. It's not merely going to become a citizen of heaven someday or when I die. You're a citizen of heaven already if you're in Christ. You're not waiting for such a status to be bestowed. Here and now, you're a citizen of heaven already by virtue of union with Christ. There's a huge contrast between yourself and the false professor. Think of 19 again, whose mind is on earthly things, whose glory is in their shame, whose God is their belly, whose end is destruction. You you think this morning that these false professors are going to end up in hell itself. 
a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place of outer darkness. But the true believer, in contrast, because his mind isn't on earthly things, his mind is on heavenly things, and he remembers this, I am a citizen of heaven right now. So there's a a, a tremendous distinction between the believer and the unbeliever. The believer is not merely living for the present. He's not living out the lust of his flesh. He's not full of pride. He's not taken up with the things of earth. He lives in light of eternity. He's living for the Savior. Not not self. He has denied himself. He has denounced his pride. And he often thinks of the world to come. Heaven is before his eyes. Heaven is on his mind. Also think of the riches of heaven. The blessing of the new birth. Born again of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of being made a new creature in Christ. The blessing of a full and free and forever justification. A perfect legal standing with God accepted in the beloved. The blessing of the love of sin being broken in one's life. He's now a a new love and and a new life and a new loyalty to Christ. The blessing of adoption. The privilege of addressing God as our Father. The blessing of being in the family of God. I've got brothers and sisters in the family who have been born of the same spirit and washed in the same blood and and of whom Christ is also their saviour. The blessing of access to God in prayer. It's not a wonderful thing to be able to say what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. God not only hears, but he also answers prayer out of his abundant supply in Christ. The blessing of being kept and protected by the grace of God. The blessing of being helped and aided by the grace of God as we live out the Christian life. The blessing of an inheritance. The blessing of heaven itself. To to go and live in the new Jerusalem, the city of God. To to be in a, a new and better country, even heaven. The blessing of having The home of many mansions. The blessing of seeing Christ one day face to face. Remember the Lord is there. Heaven's the abode of God. The blessing of being reunited to loved ones long ago. These are all the blessings that we could talk about when we think about the riches of heaven. And I've only scratched the surface. There's no doubt many more. Also think of the rest in heaven. Remember what we read in the book of Revelation It says in Revelation 14, verse 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. That there's rest in heaven. That there's reward in heaven. And it's all bound up in this little phrase. For our conversation is in heaven. Not only think this morning of the glorious home of the Christian, but very quickly, I want you to think of the glorious hope of the Christian. Look at our text. It says, From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word look is a strong term. It means far much more than just a casual glance or or a casual looking uh, for something. The the meaning of the word really is a look full of expectation, a look full of desire and passion, longing. The idea is of waiting patiently and watching expectantly. So, So if we think of that, from whence also we look and think of the words watching and waiting, from whence also we watch and wait for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ, waiting patiently, watching expectantly, fully expecting the Savior from heaven. You see, it's, it's an individual's mind who's full of hope. It's gripped with a blessed confidence. It, 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 it fills the heart and mind. Over there in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 7, Paul says, So, the, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see this is not mere wishful thinking. 
This is not merely a forlorn hope. This is not something that might happen. Something that we can be pessimistic about. It's not going to happen. This is something that's absolutely sure and certain. Not only the home of the Christian, but the hope of the Christian. He lives out his life thinking of heaven, looking for the Savior to come from that place. What does that mean? Could I suggest this morning the Savior has already come? Remember the purpose of his first coming? This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus come into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Remember, the Savior has already died. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. The the Savior has arisen bodily from the dead. That that brings in the whole doctrine of the bodily resurrection of Christ. The Savior is alive. Remember the message from the tomb. He is not here. He is risen from the dead, as he said. That, That means that the Savior's sacrifice has been accepted. Oh, thank God he's not in the tomb. Thank God he's not in the tree. His body is not decomposed and, 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 and the bones have wasted away and, and turned to dust. Why rejoice? Think of the theme, rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because he is a living saviour. Think not only of his redemptive work and not only his resurrection from the dead, but I want you to think of his reign. Think of this full title, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word Lord's refers to his deity, son of God, son of man. The, the word Jesus refers to his humanity. He, he, he had a true flesh and blood body. Christ refers, as we told you last Sunday evening, to his ministry. He's the anointed one, the anointed prophet, priest and king. And I want to tell you something. I want to encourage you. He's, he's not a king in waiting. He's a king now. He's king of kings now. He is lord of lords now. You see, he is in absolute sovereign control here and now. In this world's affairs, we get asked the question, I, I mentioned this on Wednesday night. Who rules the world? Who manages the affairs of this life? Yours and mine's. Who has the whole world in his hands? Do you know what's not the Pope? I get asked this morning, is it human governments who control the world? Is it the United States of America? Is it Russia? Is it the European Union? Is it economics that rule the world? Is it evolution that rules the world? Is it the devil? Even though we know that all hell seems as if it's been let loose in this earth. And, 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 We've got to remember, as Daniel was told, as Daniel has told us, but there's a God in heaven, and he acts and works according to his sovereign purpose. And this world, therefore, is not out of control. It's within his control, and nothing happens outside of his control, because he is king who's ruling now. We we could talk about the reigning Christ. Not only the redemptive Christ and the resurrection of Christ, But the reigning Christ, and even though at times our lives are full of dark, mysterious providences, and we could think of why this is happening, and what on earth is happening, and things appear against us like old Jacob. But think of Christ, ruling and reigning in heaven, working out his purpose. You also have to think of the return of Christ. Full of expectation. Are you full of expectation for Christ's return? Do you know that one day the trumpet will sound and heaven will open and this glorious king shall appear? And I want to tell you, he'll not come in humiliation. He'll not come again to be despised and rejected of men. He'll not come to be crowned with thorns. He'll certainly not come to be put on a cross, be mocked and slandered and insulted. No, he's going to come, as the Bible says, in power and glory. And every eye shall see him. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I want to encourage you, he's coming personally. He'd come in the very same body in which he was crucified. He's coming purposely. He's coming for his people. He's coming for those in Christ. 
Not only those who have died in Christ, but those who are alive in Christ. He's coming to put down all rebellion. He's coming to deal with the enemies of the cross. The king is coming. When? We don't know. But he's coming soon. And your duty, your responsibility is to look for him. Are are you looking for him this morning? Are are you watching patiently? Are you waiting expectantly? Full of confidence? Is this not a great confidence to fill your heart and mind? Is this not a comfort? Does Paul not say in 1 Thessalonians 4.18... Comfort yourselves with these words. What what did he mean? That Christ is coming back. That Christ is returning. This living Savior is coming. Does that not bring a challenge? Is is the call not to repent now of your sin? To, To kneel. Remember, sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will keep you longer. Sin will make a fool out of you. But you know, on that day, if you don't repent now and receive Christ by faith and bow the knee and say, all to Jesus I surrender, he's coming as judge. The judge of all the earth is coming to put down the enemies of the cross, to put down all rebellion and be all brought under his feet. That's the glorious hope of the Christian. I want to tell you something else in closing. I want you to think of the glorious heritage of the Christian. When the king comes, what's he going to do? Well, look at our text. Now, I'm only going to deal with a little part. Next Lord's Day, we'll deal with the ability of Christ. Thinking of the words, he is able. I have a little six-point sermon for you. So keep that in mind. But just think of the, 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 the main part of the text. What's he going to do when he comes? He, here's one of the things. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able to even to subdue all things unto himself. What's the return of Christ going to result in? It's going to result in the full transformation of the body of every true believer. Not only is the believer in Christ and giving that he's lived for Christ through the strength and grace of Christ. But one day he's going to be with Christ. And not only is he going to be with Christ, but here's another aspect. He's going to be like Christ. Because on the day that Christ comes, he's going to change that vile body of yours and mine, and he's going to fashion that body like unto his glorious body. We live in a body of the flesh. A body where sin dwells in thought and word and deed. A body beset about by weakness and frailty. A body full of failures and shortcomings. Maybe you're here this morning and your body's tired. Maybe you're facing illness and sickness. You struggle with many issues. And sickness is hard to deal with. Could I encourage you? Think of this in your sickness and illness. Comfort yourself with this thought that there's coming a day because I'm in Christ, I'm going to be with the King and I'm going to be like Him because He's given me a new body and there'll be no more sickness and sorrow and pain and one day this body of mine is going to be changed. The twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Are you in Him? Are you living for him through the grace and strength of him? Are are you have this confidence that you're going to be with him? And and you're going to be like him. This is what he's going to do for our body. And the body of every loved one who's died, even though it's melted into dust in a thousand atoms and scattered in the sea or, or, or to the four winds. He is able to resurrect that body and bring every atom of that body back. And fashion it like his glorious body. This is the end of every true believer. Now now in finishing. Think of the end of the false professor. The end of the false teacher. The enemies of the cross face destruction. The Bible says here. 
whose end is destruction. Nothing to do with the annihilation of their soul. It's to do with the punishment of their soul and body and hell for all eternity. There's the enemies of the cross facing destruction. Whose, whose end is destruction. Why? Because their belly has been their God. And who glory in their shame. Who do not even blush in light of their sin. Who mind earthly things. But think of the emissaries of the cross. Those who glory in the cross of Christ. Those who love the cross work of Christ. They're going to face delight. In their glorification. They're not only going to see the king in his beauty. They're not only going to be with him in heaven for all eternity. But you know what? Their body's going to be changed too. Isn't that a glorious truth? Rejoice in the Lord. Why? Think of your glorious home in heaven. Think of your glorious hope in heaven. And think of your glorious heritage. This, this is what awaits us. That should fill us with joy and hope this morning. May the Lord take these few morsels and bless them to your heart. Thank you for coming.